Welcome back to Getting Started with Linux. I'm your host, Daniel Lowry. Today's episode, we're going to look at command substitution and history. And I want to start right out of the gate with the elephant in the room, which is command substitution. It's this weird, freaky thing I've seen, I've heard about. It's like a mythical unicorn where I have one command and I kind of envelop another command inside of it. It's like a Russian doll of commands kind of thing going on here. The, the Matryoshka Please, doll of commands. Please, Ross, yeah. elucidate. <laughs> <laughs> to us, what is this command substitution? Well, command substitution is an interesting thing where you're able to take back ticks. So mm -hmm. back back to the far reaches of the upper left of the of the keyboard again here. Oh yeah, no man's land. underneath the <laughs> tilde squiggle <laughs> yeah. character it's is weird the stuff. back tick. Now, uh, when you come from the Windows world, your relationship with English is your relationship with English. Your relationship with punctuation is much less exacting and specific than it will be on the Linux world. So single quotes mean a certain thing, double quotes mean an entirely other thing, and backticks is, you'll, you'll see an apostrophe, which is the right hand, which is on, uh, on it's a single quote, effectively. Right. You'll oftentimes see things in, written in books, etc., that has a single apostrophe or a single quote and another single quote. They're almost as if they go like this. They're curved to the right. right. Well, a backtick goes like this. It's as if you had a backslash, but it's a very tiny piece of it. Okay. Backticks mean a certain thing. Backticks are like um, when you're doing math and you have an equation, and part of the equation is in parentheses. What do you do with the part of the equation that's in parentheses? You do that first. You execute that first. Right. Well, execute, solve it first, right? right? So if it's 5 plus 2, that's 7, and then the rest of the equation can come into play. When we do substitution, we kind of switch that around a little bit, and we say, here's a command, and then I want you to, in backticks, run this command and feed it to that one. So the backticks are basically the feeder operation to let the shell know, I'm mm -hmm. trying to shoehorn another command into this one. Right. So let's take a look at an example here, which would be, uh, you know, I might want to run the which command against something. Okay. okay? So if I run, uh, sorry, if I run which and then maybe AWK, it's going to come back and give me a path of the awk command, right? So which says, hey, you know what? I've got a path, and my path, it's kind of kind of long and complex. Which one of the AWK commands that may or may not be in my path is going to run? Hmm. If there's multiples, it'll show you where they are. And for example, if there were two, the first one that's listed is the one that will actually run. The other one is passed, okay? So this is important because I don't know sometimes what an actual command is. A command can be a binary, it can be a script file, it can be all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. So what I'll do is I'll run file, which when I run file against a command, it goes out and it reads the file's header and matches it against a number of different things in a table and comes back and goes, that's an executable, or that's a script file, or that's a block file. So I'll run file, and instead of having to take and go, okay, so slash user, slash bin, slash awk, I will put in backticks that previous command, like this, in the backticks, and it will then run the file command against the output of the which awk command. So which awk, this is one of those things that you'll see a lot, and we'll, 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 we'll sort of riff on this theme further on, is... Okay. A lot of the output that you'll get from commands is the full path and file name of a command. If I can see the full path and file name of it, I can scoop it up like we just did and feed it to another command. That seems extremely helpful in certain instances. It really can be, especially yeah. when you're, you're writing a script and you need to figure out what things are so you can run the right set of commands against them. Then you simply put them in command substitution, and that helps. Yeah, and, and I can see, coming from a Windows world where I don't really, I've never had to do that specifically mm -hmm. in a Windows area. You just kind of run mm -hmm. your commands. Maybe with PowerShell more often nowadays, yeah. that might happen. But traditionally, that hasn't been their forte when you get into Linux and you start thinking, everything's kind of connected. Mm -hmm. I just got to figure out ways to make them fit. Yeah. And using things like backticks is a great way to make that happen. Awesome stuff. What was that that old game that I can't, can't remember the name of it? It was like Pipes or something like that, where you where you connected the various pipes together, you know, and, and, and ran and the something little was guy to, through it. Yeah. You know, ran the little guy through it. I know I played a game like that. Mm -hmm. I think it was called Pipe Dream. Something like that. Something yeah. like that. It was an yeah. Activision or something yeah, like yeah. that. But that's the kind of concept that we're talking about. We're doing the very beginnings of putting things together, not really with pipes, but command substitution is a great 
shall we say, gateway drug uh-huh. into using pipes. Uh-huh. Okay, it gets you really hooked on it, and so it really like, does. This, yeah. this really works for me. Makes my life a whole lot easier. Mm-hmm. So, getting this as a part of your repertoire is something mm-hmm. you really want to make. Happen. Well, the other thing is, a lot of times you, you'll do these commands, and you'll realize, hey, I did a really good job with that. You know, I want to make sure that I can get back to that command. Right. And so that brings us into the concept of, you know, what if you like the command a lot? Hit up arrow and go find it. Yeah, and you know that brings up a great question. I was thinking about this. Mm-hmm. I'm watching you. You're hitting the up arrow. I'm. I'm thinking to myself, where, where is that coming from? Mm-hmm. Where, how does the shell know that that was your last command? And you won't accept magic as the answer. Right? I mean, magic is cool. I like magic, but <laughs> I would probably, if I need to actually know how this works, I always, I always, <laughs> I always tell classes that you know, there's, there's the concept of what you did, and then what occurred, yeah. and the section in the middle. That's the Tamo, or the Then a Miracle Occurs box. <laughs> yeah. Our job is to shrink the Then a Miracle Occurs box yes. to as small as possible. Yes. May not be able to get rid of it, but let's try. So let's switch over to the system and let's take a look at the concept of history. The history uh, that we're discussing is everything. For, so when you install the system and the user first signs on, the first command that you run is effectively history number one. Mm-hmm. So when I run the history command, which is what I use to actually see this, I'm going to see that I'm up to 84 different commands now. That's I a have lot. systems that have thousands on them. Oh goodness! Yeah, and you know, it's been you've been around for a while. You've used the system for a while. You've done a lot of command line work on it. You can have hundreds or thousands. Now there is typically a logical limit, and that is actually set in the Bash RC file. Oh. So you can say I want to keep 5,000 lines or whatever you want. The beauty of the history command is if you look at this, you'll see that each and every one of them is numbered. Now, I just typed the history command, which is number 84. One of the simplest history command hacks of all is to press the double exclamation point. Double exclamation point says, whatever I just ran, run it again. Awesome. Now, I ran history, so then I just ran, so history, ran history again. again. Yeah. So double exclamation point is run whatever the previous one was and, you know, and increment. Now, one of the other things that's a lot of fun is, for example, you see up here, I've got the PWD command here, and I've got LSBLK. If I wanted to, I can go straight to one of these. So I just look at the number, number 75. So the exclamation point and then the number that I want to run again, when I hit enter, then it goes and it finds that particular line and re-executes that for me. That could be super useful if you had one of those really long command mm-hmm. strings and you're, you're yep. like, oh, well, there it is. Yep. I could copy and paste it. I could do that, but just reference the number. Yeah, and, and if you don't need to make any changes to it, you just reference it. Right, you it. just follow it. Yeah. Right. Okay, yeah, that's so history, history is super uh, useful in that regard. Another thing that we can do, and this is something, so we'd reference the fact that we might have thousands of lines of whatever. Mm-hmm. You know somewhere in you know somewhat maybe recent memory that you ran something, and it was really cool, but you don't remember what it is. Right. So you could do several things. The first one, if we switch back over here, so we switch over here and we take a look and then we've talked about history with regard to having lots and lots and lots of commands in my history. One thing that I can do is I can type history and I can, oops, I can pipe it to the less command. And that allows me to scroll through, it starts up at number one. So mm-hmm. I might have 3000 entries in here and I can scroll down or what I can do is I can do a forward slash, which says search for whatever I type next. So if I type LS BLK, it's going to show me the entries where I ran LSBL. It highlights them for me. And so now I would go, oh, number 75 and number 85. I could hit Q for quit and then do my 75 again, which will run LSBLK for me. The last piece of this is to use a great tool called grep, which we'll talk about quite a bit more. But grep is a way of filtering something. So if I want to, I can type... If I want to, I can type it correctly. <laughs> type history, and then I pipe this, send the output of history to the grep command, and we'll do grep and then lsblk. So I'm looking in all the output that would otherwise come from the history command. I'm throwing everything away, but the lines that match the string lsblk. And it should show me the three or four times, including this one, hmm that I actually had done that. So this is super helpful when you have two or three or 4,000 lines long and you got this wonderful command back there. I mean, literally I have taken history files 
that I've had on a particular system and copied them and archived them, you know, for, for later. Cause like, like I did yeah. some really great stuff this in here. This was amazing. I'm, I'm keeping yeah. this one. Yeah. Yes. This is, I would like to enter this in the congressional record, but, yeah. <laughs> you know, but, it, but it, this history is one of those things that if you had never used it before, you really didn't know what you were missing. Yeah. Some hidden gem in the system. And if you're mm. not, if you're not aware of this, can really save you some time and effort, especially down the road. You never know when you're like, oh, man, just go back in the mm-hmm. history see if I can't find that. Yep. Use grip. Grab that right out of there. Just got to remember something unique about it. Mm-hmm. Pull it right out. Great stuff. One tiny small thing. The history command is very powerful. Not only is it powerful, but if those commands are typed on your system and they're still around, they can come back to bite you. So first of all, kids, don't ever do anything wrong. Second of all, we actually sent somebody to the federal penitentiary because of things they had typed on their machine. Mm. So the history command is important, it's long lasting, and if you're doing bad things, it really can be used against you. It's like a court stenographer that follows you around as you <laughs> work in your Linux system. Very so if scary you say thought. anything wrong, <laughs> yeah, right. it's, it's gonna record it and keep it yep. for record. So yep. great stuff. Ross, thanks for showing us how we can use both substitution for command or command substitution as well as that history. Mm-hmm. Really save us some time and effort. A lot of great stuff there. We thank you for watching, but we're gonna come back with a little more and are getting started with Linux. But as for now, we're gonna call it a day. Thanks for watching, everyone. See you next time.